Hello, I'm Tracy Metz. Welcome to Water Talks, The Big Five. This is a series of five conversations with people I interviewed for the podcast about the UN Water Conference and the New York Water Week, made possible by the Dutch Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management. Some of our guests had such amazing things to say that we wanted to give them more airtime. The absolute worst thing you can do with an oyster shell is throw it in the garbage. It's a resource for future restoration projects. They slow the water, they clean the water, they help rebuild the beaches. That's landscape architect Kate Orff, the creator of something called oyster texture. More about that in a minute. Kate Orff has her own studio, Scape, and is a professor at Columbia University in New York. Time magazine called her one of the 100 most influential people of 2023. Oyster texture is a method of using oyster shells to create what she calls living breakwaters that not only help clean the water of New York Harbor, but will also help calm the storm surge during the next superstorm. You can hear her in episode four of Water Talks, Too Dirty. This is the longer version of my interview with her during the New York Water Week and the UN Water Conference in 2023. I started the conversation with Kate by asking her how she came up with the idea of using oysters to protect New York's shores. Bays across the world are in various states of decline due to sea level rise, excess nitrogen, these kind of combination of factors that affects these intertidal landscapes. So I wrote an essay and a book on that and then had this germ in my mind of the oyster as part of the answer. I was asked by the Museum of Modern Art to do a project for an exhibition that they were hosting called Rising Currents. And then Superstorm Sandy hit and then all of a sudden it was like, okay, let's see if we can test some of these ideas about ecological infrastructure in real time. So oyster texture predated Sandy by several years. That's right. You were already thinking about how oysters, which have a long tradition in New York, maybe you can talk about that, how oysters could help make the city more resilient long before the hurricane came. That's such foresight. It's foresight, but it's also incredibly practical. If you were to look at a map, and there's some fabulous maps of New York from 1700s that really show the original indigenous peoples of this area, the Lenape cultivating oysters or farming or capturing conch, etc. But they didn't live in these areas. So if you look at these old maps, you see very clearly urban pattern that's developed on the ridge lines of our built environment, of our topography. You see this very thriving, lush water's edge that is not a physical line. It's a blur or a hatch. It has this rich intertidal landscape. Somehow, 200 years later, we've forgotten all of those lessons and we've filled in these edges. We've straightened the edges. Oyster texture was just basically born from having the seed of the idea of the oyster in my brain, but also looking at maps of New York, it's quite obvious (laughs) that we were protected by this mosaic of coastal ecosystems. We derived our food from them. We farmed them. So Living Breakwaters was informed by all of that work and also informed by how to bring these layers together, one of rebuilding ecosystems, but Second, and more importantly in that context, how to build back kind of this coastal protection that we've lost. What do these artificial reefs do? Are they meant to slow down the impact of the water? I mean, a hurricane is so huge. How can they help? Sandy came in almost like through the front door, if you would say, like its path was through the New York Bight. And that is why Staten Island was hit so hard. It was directly in the line of that storm. We've also dredged our outer harbor. So we made almost like a super highway. So that was accelerating. We've had an incredible amount of erosion in our harbor. Oyster reefs once were around 25%. So we had cleaner water, slower water. Those populations have collapsed due to water quality and overharvesting. So basically, we have deeper harbors with dredged superhighways leading up to where people are living now. These breakwaters are now, of course, artificial, but they're serving a similar purpose that an intact oyster reef would have done, which is 
to slow the water. First of all, take that harmful velocity, the wave action out of the water so it does not stop flooding. And I think that's a key thing that I have to say over and over again. This is not some kind of quote unquote solution for flooding. Nothing stops flooding right? because you have rainwater and you have coastal inundation, you have groundwater. But what they do, which is absolutely critical, is that they dramatically reduce loss and damage and harm. So you're not going to have a home thrown off of its foundations because of a powerful wave. You may have some flooding in your basement, but we need to begin to adapt to that. They slow the water, they clean the water, they help rebuild the beaches. After Superstorm Sandy, we did a big community event, and one that is seared into my brain is walking along a beach with residents who said, this beach used to be 50 feet wide, you know, and you can actually see pipes and lampposts, and you can see how the shoreline had been dramatically reduced just in somebody's lifetime. So that erosion will be slowed down, halted by the introduction of these breakwaters. Are these breakwaters now incorporated into official New York urban policy? These rules and regulations were made with a very good reason to stop people from just dumping garbage in the wetlands and capping it. But now we need a different set of tools relative to climate change, sea level rise, increasing hurricane activity. I see the breakwaters as a pilot for the New York region, of course, but really for the United States, making it easier for the next (laughs) cities and towns to be able to implement strategies like this. Was the idea right from the start that this would become not just a landscape concept, but an actual community endeavor? The power of urban design and architecture is to understand and somehow channel (laughs) these spatial designs and birth them out into the world. So it's not an idea or a concept that like descends and just like lands on the ground and then you clip the ribbon and leave. I think the most powerful vehicle for urban transformation is in networks of people who are committed to similar ideas and who share the same goals. This is a piece of physical infrastructure, clearly, that has immense protective benefit. But it's also a vehicle for a whole new social community, whether that's fishermen or students or teachers, oyster restoration experts. It's essentially a tool for all of these different communities to come together and persist and be invested in this. Kate Orff's Living Breakwaters Projects has an even more ambitious spinoff, the Billion Oyster Project. The goal is to reintroduce a billion oysters in the New York Harbor, cleaning the water and protecting the shores. To do that, they actually need oyster shells with which to build artificial reefs and to make a place for new baby oysters to grow. They get a lot of these shells from local restaurants, which also take the opportunity to tell diners about why this is a good idea. The absolute worst thing you can do with an oyster shell is throw it in the garbage. It's a resource for future restoration projects. And so here in New York, we have a shell recovery program. Baltimore, Corpus Christi, Jacksonville, Florida, every city on the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic needs to have a shell recovery program to help assist these restoration projects of the future. That's just absolutely key. There's actually a lack of shells right now in the restoration community, and it's very easy to implement. Restaurants love it because they can keep their shells and donate it to future causes, and hopefully consumers love it. And consumers should demand this, not just be passive about it. What else needs to happen to make the breakwaters realize their potential? (laughs) The most important thing that we can invest in now is literally physically, physical, intact landscapes, robust, interconnected landscapes that will help cool our air, that will help filter our water, that will help reduce erosion, because frankly, we have eliminated those landscapes. We're in a deforested environment. We've filled in our coastal edges with garbage and straightened them out. So I feel like a big part of what I've tried to communicate is it's not just one project, it's not just one idea, but that the breakwaters are a part of a layered system of an intact physical landscape. It's not just solving one problem, right? What the breakwaters can do is help slow down water and label shoreline grasses to take root. That also further reduces erosion, right? So I'm looking for a whole landscape reset, right? Where 
We can think from our waterways to our intertidal landscapes to our upland landscapes and really think about ecological restoration and regeneration, particularly in the places that are most vulnerable to some of these climate issues, as a big part of how we'll make ourselves more resilient to climate change in the future in whatever form that takes. It may be extreme heat in one year. It may be tidal inundation, coastal inundation another year. It may be extreme rain another year. We have multiple varied three-dimensional mosaic of threats ahead of us. And I really feel like these intact forests, shorelines, coastal edges, these are going to be what really enables us to avoid disasters in the future. Is this actually happening on the ground? Living breakwaters is nearing completion, which is quite exciting. And of course, it's been about eight years in the making and quite an extensive modeling and engagement and permitting process. So I feel like that's a big, exciting moment for SCAPE and for our partners on the project. And then in general, do feel like this notion of revitalized urban landscapes is coming back. Getting people invested in new, more natural ways of protecting the places they live seems to be a trend. Less blind faith in technology more nature-based solutions, and a more social response to climate change. Does she see things changing? I see a very profound shift in exactly as you've described, where I think that there's just this realization that water is not a problem to be solved, (laughs) if you will. It is a life force, right? It is sustaining and I think there's an increasing focus on climate justice and water justice and an increasing focus that the problems, the way of thinking that got us into this situation is not necessarily the way of thinking that's going to get us to a very different place. Less emphasis on the kind of technocratic top-down solution, a little bit more emphasis on climate justice. Some examples I could cite are For example, we were in Varanasi in India maybe four to five years ago. A Coca-Cola plant had opened just outside the city limits and had struck a well all the way down to draw water for its plant. And all of a sudden, a year and a half later, there's no water in people's household wells. And of course, there are regional issues around the Ganges with incredible deforestation and the water levels and the water quality in the Ganges itself. So you unlock these stories over time and you see how they're interrelated and how water justice really exists from very many scales. Final question, Kate. We see that uh, for many large infrastructure projects, the whole world is dependent on large firms, industry, with huge investments to actually make these projects happen. Is there any way out of approaching water as a profit motive, assuming that we see water too much as a commodity and not enough as a human right? Yes, I think we need to simply put in place the financial, legal, and social tools to reclaim that. I've been to places in Africa, in parts of India, where you cannot obviously drink water, but there's water being sold by like water mafia trucks on the street. There is a burgeoning privatization of water we see around the world. I think that is something that we do need to push back on and reconceive as part of a global compact. It is definitely a trend that I've also witnessed something to be incredibly wary of. A warning there from Kate Orff, ending this edition of Water Talks, The Big Five. We'll link to Kate Orff's studio, Scape, in the show notes. Make sure you check it out. Water Talks is a program by me, Tracy Metz, written and produced together with Jonathan Gruber. Next up in this companion series of interviews to Water Talks is the Chief Climate Officer of the City of New York, Rit Agarwala. Before this, he was the person behind the city's sustainability plan. He thinks that New York has made a lot of progress since Hurricane Sandy. One of the things he said that really struck me is that New York is looking not only to keep the water out, but also to rebound quickly when it does come in. Our theme song is called 
Into the Unknown by Poddington Bear, with additional music from Jason Shaw's Running Waters. Water Talks was made possible by the Dutch Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management. I'm Tracy Metz. Thanks for listening.